Mm. Jagardif. The path is very, very different than what people think it is. We have this heritage of struggling. We struggle to get what we want. We struggle to avoid what we don't want. And society teaches us that's just how it is, but we want to make sure that you want what we want you to want and don't want what we don't want you to want. So they struggle with us. Everybody's struggling one way or another. You see that. All the opposition, all the struggling, all the disharmony. And it's because of that. It's because you're okay when you get what you want. You're not okay when you don't get what you want or when you get what you don't want. Well, so is everybody else. How do you decide what you want? Believe it or not, you make it up. You just decide based upon your past experiences, based on a book you read, a movie you watched, somebody talked to you, whatever. Generally, it's your past experiences. And, and by the way, those are past experiences. What movie you watch, what book you read, who talked to you, those are past experiences. And you take those past experiences, and sometimes they're pleasant and sometimes they're not, and you store. This is what was pleasant, this is what was not. And then you try to recreate the situations or avoid the situations. And since there's like a teaching that I hope everybody gets as a foundation, everybody is different. Everybody is different. Way more different than you think. Why? Because they've all had different experiences. Nobody has had the experience you've had. Maybe one area, you played ball together or something like that. But what did you do the rest of the time and when you were growing up? and. Everybody has billions and trillions of experiences all the time. And so they're different. And they've chosen from those experiences what they like and what they don't like. And even if you had the same experiences, I guarantee you, you would choose differently what you like and what you don't like. Just because of maybe when somebody was nice to you, you were in a bad mood. So you don't like them anyways. Maybe you were in a really, really good mood and they were mean to you and you thought it was cute. You like them a lot. You know what I'm saying? So it's not just the experience, it's how you took the experience, which is dependent upon your past experiences. So the matrix is extremely complicated. I hope you see that. It's not 3D chess, it's 7,000 degree every game at once, truthfully. So nobody is like you. Nobody is like you. It can't possibly happen. It's impossible. Everybody had different experiences all the time, and everybody handled them differently based on their past experiences. So it's very complex. And so basically, we're out there fighting. We're out there struggling. We sometimes make alliances within a particular area. A person seems to agree with our views. I guarantee you they don't. There'll be some time where all of a sudden you'll find yourself disagreeing what you mean by the exact same word because it's all based on your experiences. I have lots, lots of examples I could give to that. <laughs> right? It's just amazing. So what does it mean? It means you're going to struggle. What do you mean? Well, you're going to struggle first because you're not okay, because you stored stuff inside of you that's not okay. If you store stuff inside of you that's not okay, you're not going to be okay. I like to get these as the foundational teachings. If you store things all the time that are inside of you that bothered you, you're going to be bothered. You're not going to not be bothered. Suppress them all you want. It causes more trouble. You can give in to them because there's more trouble. I don't care what you do with them. If you stored them, they're there. They're in there. They do not go away, period. Things you store, by definition, store means keep. You keep them, and they bother you one way or another. And so you've, you know you do that all the time. Things bother you, you store them. And so then inside is bothered. And what do you do about it? You struggle to have things happen outside that previously have made you feel better. Fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it doesn't work. No one has ever succeeded in doing that. The richest people, the most beautiful people, handsome people, popular people, it doesn't matter. The suicide rate amongst the advanced Western nations is higher than anything else in the world. Well, why would that be? They have everything. Yeah, right. The net result is you are inside and you are struggling. Struggling to not struggle. Struggling to get insurance, to get this, to get a relationship. This, money, I don't care, name it. Just trying to get these things outside that will make you feel better inside. Why? Because you don't feel good inside. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing this. But everybody's doing it. Don't worry about it. They're just doing it about different things because they've had different experiences. 
So you struggle to try and get things the way you want. Everybody else is struggling to try and get things the way they want. And since nobody agrees, it's a mess out there. I can remember back in, in the 60s, I was an activist, you know, ain't they were marching, this and that, and the other thing. And I woke up and somebody said to me, why is there so much war? And my mind said, I don't know why there's not more. And there really is. You know, families have wars, brothers and sisters have wars, fathers and daughters. <laughs> but the net result is there's a lot of fighting going on out there, isn't there? That's why. Because everybody has a different notion of what needs to happen for them to be okay. And like I said, they form alliances which says, okay, in this particular area, we're going to do the same thing. It doesn't ever last, okay? Russia was part of the Allied forces. Not now, okay? It's like there were all kinds of alliances that get formed all over the place. But because they're not really the same of what they want, they're just working together at that moment to get a part of what they want, what they think they want. So basically, you struggle. You struggle to get things the way you want, avoid what you don't want. Everybody else is doing the same thing. And since we're competing for the same resources on the same plane, in the same planet, in the same countries, et cetera, et cetera, there's this fighting struggle that goes on out there. And politics is that struggle. Everything that struggle. Relationships are that struggle. I like her. You like her. Get out of my way. Jealousy, insecurity, all, every single thing in the human spectrum is because you are struggling to get things the way you want. And there's competition out there. It's not easy to get things the way you want, and it's almost impossible to keep them that way, isn't it? You work hard. Get someone to love you. See how hard you work to make sure you wear the same thing. You stay young. You look at this. You don't say stupid things. Other people have to like you that they like. What if their friends don't like you? Oh, my God, it's dangerous. You're working. That is called struggling. When Buddha said all life is suffering, it doesn't mean you break your arm every day. It means you're doing that. I don't care if you're rich or poor, young or old. It doesn't matter. You're doing that. You're struggling to try and make things be the way you want so you can be okay. That is not spirituality. That is the antithesis of spirituality. That's why I think it's hilarious that nowadays they try to teach you, which is fine. I like everybody's teachings is all wonderful. That laws of attraction are very important, that you should be able to attract to yourself whatever you want. The trouble is, in that sense, there was this thing called whatever you want. I just told you what happens with your wants. You struggle to make them happen. So trying to attract them with mantras or with good behavior is just another way to struggle to try and get things the way you want. So get them the way you want. Go on, attract a house to you, attract a relationship to you. How long does it last that you don't want anything else? Never, ever has anyone ever gotten something they wanted and didn't want anything else. It's impossible. And one of the great masters, I heard him say it, he used the word never, like I just did, but it's okay for him to do it, not for me. And he said, no one has ever satisfied a desire by fulfilling it. That's some challenging words. You temporarily feel better because you're not struggling about it right then. The desire is still there. You just put something on top of it. Have the thing go away that you put on top of it and see what happens. You're freaking out. If fulfilling a desire took care of it, made it so it went away, then you have a desire, you do something, and it's gone for the rest of your life. There's nothing. It doesn't matter. It's unconditional. It's unconditionally gone. You meet somebody, you love them, they say they love you, it's the most beautiful relationship. Okay, it's over. That's fine. You got what you wanted. They leave. No, I don't think so. You put something on top of the desire, and if that something is challenging, or you think it's challenging, or it leaves, or it dies, or it does anything, you know, it doesn't take much, all of a sudden, you feel the problem again. You're trying to get a different relationship or change this person or do something so it continues to take care of what's bothering you. That's what's meant by no one has ever gotten rid of a desire by fulfilling it. It just temporarily compensates for it, puts something on top of it, looks encouraging, and it is. It feels better. No question about that. It's not bothering you at that time. But if you think it's going to change, it'll bother the heck out of you. So that path of struggling outside to get what you want and avoid what you don't want is the antithesis of spiritual growth. Everything you are doing, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. It's not about renunciation. It's about growing, all right? So you don't have to worry about, oh my God, I can't do anything. You can do whatever you want, but learn from it. Grow from it. You will eventually reach the point in your growth where you realize it doesn't work. It's not wrong. You're not going to go to hell. You just live in hell. It's not a terrible thing to go out there and try to get what you want. But it is a terrible thing to not get what you want and then freak out about it. And to get what you want and be afraid of losing it, which you are. So it's called waking up. You wake up and you realize there's nothing wrong with it. It just doesn't work. 
There needs to be a better way to be okay than to struggle to try and make things be the way you want and avoid what you don't want. And fortunately, there is. Unfortunately, your first step when you wake up, we're talking about the stages of your growth, the struggling doesn't go away. You just bring the struggling inside. You sit there and start noticing, oh my God, I got a crazy mind inside my head saying all this stuff and negative and this and that and it won't shut up and I can't meditate and my ego is out of control. It's like Everything has to be exactly the way it wants. It complains all the time. And so you struggle in there. The same struggle you did out there, you have now internalized to struggle with yourself. It's a higher struggle in the sense that there's no competition inside of you. You have to compete outside with everywhere to get what you want. Inside, there's only you. There's all this in there. There's nobody else in there. So believe it or not, you're much better off with that inner struggle. And some people consider that spiritual growth. Doing these intense things to shut yourself up and meditate and do that. And it's called tapasya. That's the word tapasya. Do things that challenge your ego, that challenge your self-concept. And you know, try to rip it off and get rid of it. And that's a struggle. And people do that. Not so many people because none of them move the struggle inside. It is spiritual to move the struggle inside. But look what happens. Then they start to find a renunciation as spirituality. What does that mean? I want to get married. I want to have close relationships. I want to have money. I want to have people like me, but I won't do it. Well, there's a nice struggle for you. <laughs> you will struggle forever with that. The best you can do is suppress it. And we've seen what happens with that. So if you struggle inside and define the answer being I'm pure, I don't have an ego, I'm so high, I don't have a single problem in the whole world, what do you do when you do have a problem? I deny it, I push it away. I, no, it's not happening inside of me. Or you struggle to get to that state. Okay, spirituality is never a struggle. And people will not teach you that. Spirituality is not a struggle. If you're struggling, you're not there yet. You're just kind of a novice. You're playing around. You can't handle yourself. It's a mess in there, so you fight with yourself. One part of your sister says, I can't think like that. That's terrible. I'm embarrassed. I can't, right? Okay, so what does it mean to grow spiritually? Let's just stop right there, and maybe this can help you skip a whole bunch of steps because it is not about how long you can meditate. It's not about how quiet your mind can be. Why do I say that? If your mind is naturally quiet, it is about that. Maribel said, man minus mind equals God. But if you're making your mind be quiet, it isn't about that. Because then you still have stuff inside of you that is trying to express itself through a noisy mind and you're pushing that down. You're denying it. I don't want it to be there. Okay? That's a, that's a whole other state that you will eventually fall from. You will not be able to maintain that. So what does it mean to truly grow spiritually? How do I skip these different states? You wake up and you realize very scientifically Everything has a reason for the way it is. Everything. I don't care if it's a nice thing, a bad thing, whatever it is. Every single thing in creation has a reason for the way it is. I'm not going to sit there and say, because God wants it to be that way. I'm going to say, because it is the result of all the things that made it be that way. It's called cause and effect. There are things that happen through time and space that when they consolidated and came together, integrated together in this moment, they caused the moment to be the way it is. You have to be a great scientist for that, do you? Okay? If anything different had happened, the moment would be different. I have fun talking about the fact that you all talk about car accidents. What does an accident mean? That it wasn't supposed to happen, had no reason to happen, it was just an accident. Really? What if one of the members of the car accident, their coffee machine was slow today? Then they wouldn't have been there. Well, why was the coffee machine slow? Well, it was made in Korea, and the person who put the element together had a fight with their wife the night before and didn't screw the screw down fully seven years ago. <laughs> How are you calling it an accident? If you took all the factors, all the factors, the road, the person, the this, the that, every single thing leading up to that moment, it was a have to be. It was a this is happening and going to happen based on all the factors that came together and coalesced to cause that to happen. Does that make sense to you? Well, wow, that's neat. So that's a little different take on everything's the way it should be because God said so. Everything's the way it is because science said so. And science is God as much as anything else. I do that in the new book, Living Untethered. 
if you start from creation in the beginning with the Big Bang, I'm telling you, if anything was different, if the charge of an electron was point oh 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 one different than the way it is, you ain't here. Nor is any atom, nor is anything the way it is. It took the perfection of exactly what it was to come together and consolidate and work with the neutrons and the whole ball game that builds atoms. And, you know, if anything changed at all. I give I mean, my favorite example in the new book. I like the new book. My favorite examples, which usually I don't talk about in the talk because I want you to read it, is, is as follows. If your great, 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 great grandmother did not meet your great, 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 great grandfather, you're not here. It's like, wow, how many things had to happen? I tell the whole story in the book because I know how your great, great, great grandfather met your great, great, great grandmother. It's quite the story. You should read it. But the net result is there was a reason. There's a reason that it happened, just like the accident. And you ended up here. Isn't that amazing? And if anything had changed, if anything had changed, if someone didn't yell at you a year ago, you wouldn't have the impression that the place where you drove by, you remembered that you felt weird, so you drove faster or slower or said something to the person next to you, it caused everything different. So you wake up and you realize things are the way they are because of what made them be that way. That's how it is. And you don't struggle with them. This is real spiritual growth. You don't not struggle with them because they're right or wrong or because you like them or don't like them. You don't struggle with the moment in front of you because it's the result of all that ever was, which is kind of honorable. <laughs> you understand that? If this thing shows up in front of you, it's like it's not in front of anybody else. They're at a different angle. You're seeing it unique. And the other one that really blew me when I finally realized it, not only is the moment, who's this moment right now, every moment, you're seeing it different than anybody else. And you're the only one who's seeing it. And you're the only one that will ever see it. And the only one that ever saw it. Wow. That makes it special. Doesn't it? You are getting a private showing of life. Nobody has seen what you've seen. Have they? Has anyone seen what you've seen? Not even one moment they don't see it. Not to mention the sequence of the moments. You want to be special? You're pretty special. This is spirituality. It's not about getting what you want. It's about waking up to realize, wow, look what's in front of me. Where did it come from? Not do I like it. Not do I not like it. That's absurd. It's the result of every moment from the beginning of time. 13.8 billion years evolved and then made that moment. And you want to not like it. In the book, I asked you a question. What if someone walked up to you and said, is it okay with you that Saturn has rings? That's absurd. What's it got to do with me? Same thing with every moment in front of you. Same thing with every moment in front of you. It is a result of all the forces that ever were came together to make Saturn have rings. And all the forces that ever were came together to have your husband have a bad day, come home, and not say hello. But it's not okay with you, is it? Well, that's the same as saying it's not okay that Saturn has rings. This is spirituality. It's called acceptance, surrender, honor, respect, appreciation. For what? The moment in front of you. You've got to have a moment. You know, they say it was such a special moment. They're all special moments and they're yours. The problem is you can't handle that. You have something inside of you called your ego, your self-concept, your psyche that you have built in there that is so distracting and it makes so much noise that you listen to it all the time instead of respecting and honoring the reality of the moments unfolding in front of you. And so the next thing you know, you're struggling. There is no struggling. There's just, wow. I wish I could take you to Mars. If I could take you to Mars for an hour, certainly a day, you want to come back here. Why? There's nothing going on on Mars. <laughs> there's, there's no good moments or bad moments or high moments or low moments and colors. Or, it's just sand, a bunch of sand all over the place. You know, like that? There's nothing. No creatures, no living ad, nothing. And here, there's always something going on in front of you, isn't it? Always. From the minute you're born to the minute you die, there's always something going on. Well, why is that not something to celebrate and appreciate and say thank you all the time for every single thing? 
I can't even begin to list all the things that are going on around you at any given moment. And that's just one moment. I told you, you have 25 trillion living cells inside your body talking to each other, working together to give you a body. What's the last time you said thank you to your liver, your pancreas, your pineal gland? And how many of those things are there? There's billions of those things working together. And you wouldn't be here if one cell misbehaves. We have a name for it, cancer. And 25 trillion of them are working together your whole life. And you get real mad and upset. Why me when one doesn't? And you never said thank you to the 25 trillion? Does that sound fair? Does that sound reasonable? So you start waking up. This is spirituality. That's what spirituality is. It's not renouncing and fighting and struggling and so on. It's honoring and respecting and accepting and being blown away that you get to be here. You get to see this. And by the way, don't worry. You won't last very long. You won't be here long. The Earth's been here for 4.5 billion years. How long are you going to be here? That's a pretty small percentage. So you wake up and realize there is no problem. There are just experiences that are reality that are unfolding in front of you. And no one else has had them. They're unique. They're special. They're yours. And you get to deal with them. You get to learn how to dance with creation, with God. Call it whatever you want. That's the reality. You dance with the, the moment in front of you. took millions of years to get there. Everything had to be exactly the same. So you honor it. You respect it. And you kind of ask, how can I help? That's what a spiritual being does. They don't judge the moment in front of them. They're just looking at it and saying, wow, look at that. How can I help? Can I be of service? Because I don't, I'm not saying, how can you give me what I want? I'm not playing that game. You gave up on that. That doesn't work. Imagine if you appreciated, respected, and loved and honored every moment unfolding in front of you. That's the end of everything, isn't it? That's the end of your desires, end of your fears, end of anything. Because I'm honoring what's in front of me, honoring reality. Christ did that. Forgive them, Lord. They know not what they do. Not my will, but thy will. Everything he did was what we're talking about. It all was the respect. He even took Judas, kissed him on the cheek, and said, go do what you must do. That was a high being understanding that reality wins and the willingness to go through what he went through as an act of surrender. Very beautiful. That's when you're growing spiritually. Notice, I'm coming back to struggling. He did not struggle. He did for one moment in the garden before they arrested him. He said, may I pass this cup? I love that moment. May I pass this cup? What do you mean? Well, there was a human there too, <laughs> right? You're living inside of a body. And he saw the whole vision was going to happen to him. And he did say that. He said, may I pass this cup? And the moment he said that, the second he said that, he said, no, not my will, but thy will. And never resisted one iota through the entire ordeal after that. Complete surrender. Okay, so basically spirituality is this. Spirituality is not about struggling, not about struggling outside to make it be what you think it's supposed to be, what you need it to be. And it's not about struggling inside to say, I'm not pure. I got to get pure and I got to do good things. You know, that's ego, superego that, that, that Freud talked about, it, ego and superego. Freud's right. It is the body's representative in your mind. I need this. I want that or f- physiological things, biological things, etc. And the superego, society's representative inside your mind. They laid a trip on your head, so all the time you shouldn't have done that. You know you shouldn't have done that. And the ego is the, the self-concept trying to live between these two and make up a you that you can live with. There, Freud was completely right. That's all just mind. Who's noticing that? That's spirituality. Then you step back and say, wait a minute. Do you have an ego? Does anybody have an ego? I don't care about what people think about them. Ever get embarrassed by anything? Ever feel guilt for anything you've ever done? Got an ego? Okay, that's the ego. How do you know you're having those things? How do you know you feel guilt? Most people go to a psychologist or therapist and say, oh, I'm feeling so much guilt. What do I do? I don't know. I left my family and I'm not so sure I should have. I needed to. It's been going on for years. I have so much guilt. A normal, trained psychologist tries to get into, well, was there anything else you could have done? Or, you know, you need to go forward and learn. No, yogis are very, very easy in, in therapy. It's as follows. Uh, doctor, I feel all this guilt and all this stuff. And you sit for a second, listen to it, not for more than a second. <laughs> and you sit there and say, how do you know? How do I know what? How do you know you feel guilt? I told you I feel guilt. I know you told me that. I want to know how you know you feel guilt. Well, 
eventually you'll look at him and him or her and yell because I'm in here and I see it. Who is in there? Who sees it? What is the consciousness that notices you are looking at this thing called guilt? What is the consciousness that notices you're looking at a thing that it feels guilt until you see somebody and apologize? Feel, you tell them, I feel better. How do you know? How do you know? How do you know? How do you know? How do you know you feel better? How do you know you feel guilt? How do you know you feel love? How do you know you feel disdain? How do you know you want to get divorced? How do you know you want to get married? How do you know? I know the mind's saying those things, but how do you know it's saying those things? My mind says things you don't know. Okay? Your mind says things one minute, says things the next. Do you, oh, doctor, I can't make up my mind. Look at that. Back when I went, I don't know, was it fifth grade, sixth grade, right? They dissected sentences. Well, that was a long time ago. They had blackboards, and they would draw this line. They, the adjective would go here, and the verb would go here, and the direct object would go over here, and they'd dissect the sentence. Okay? So let's take the sentence. My mind is driving me crazy. Okay, very good. I like that very much. My mind is driving me crazy. Whose mind? My is a possessive pronoun. You use it very naturally. My mind's doing much better today since we talked. Whose? You said my mind is doing better. How do you know? Who's my? And you wake up eventually and you realize I am conscious. And I'm noticing what the mind is doing. I'm noticing what the heart is doing. I'm noticing what the emotions are. I'm noticing the expressions and feeling I'm getting from my body. I'm noticing what's going on outside of me. Who, who, who? Can you be talking to somebody outside and you see them, hear them, and at the same time you feel what's going on inside of you? Yes or no? You can't have thoughts going on inside of you at the same time that someone's talking to you and not even listening to them. There's all, you listen to your thoughts instead. Who is doing that? That's spirituality. And it's not a struggle. It's not a struggle. It's a realization. You realize I'm in here and I got this mind in here with me. I got this ego in here with me. That's a strong one. What's your ego like? Is it sensitive? Is your ego sensitive? Does it get defensive? Have you defined how you are and insist that other people see you that way? These are all your ego. Someday you will learn to watch that and realize, oh, that's an ego. It's not me. I'm the one who notices that that's doing that. I notice that it can't take him anywhere. He just gets hurt by everything. And if somebody else isn't hurting him, he's hurting himself by thinking that somebody else is thinking. If you think that somebody thinks that somebody else thinks that they don't like you, it bothers you. That's ego. It's a very sensitive little ball of trouble that you develop inside of you. Psychology calls it a self-concept. A concept is not real. It's something made up. A concept is something made up. Do you understand that? So basically you made this thing up and now you're walking around with it controlling your mind and your heart. It controls your mind and your heart. Somebody says something, your heart starts hurting. Somebody says something, your mind starts talking. Somebody doesn't say something, your heart starts hurting. I told you, you're in an intimate moment. You feel so much love. And so you say, I love you. I love you so much. And there's silence. How are you doing? Why do you care if they say something back? You have the honor of feeling love. And love is a wonderful thing to feel. You said you feel it. I guarantee you, 10 seconds later, you're not feeling it, are you? They're supposed to say, I love you too. You know, what if they don't? What if they say it like this? Yeah, I love you too. <laughs> you think that that means the answer to this is to train them. That when you say, I love you, you look at me. You sleep on the couch for three weeks. You, you say, I love you like you mean it. And you think that's the answer. And I would struggle. No, the answer is not. The answer is to look at that part of your being and say, I don't know about you, but I like love. And the fact that somebody doesn't say what I expect them to say when I'm feeling love, I ain't giving my love away for that. Period. Period. But what if it's an indication that they don't really love me? I don't care. If I feel love, I thought it's about feeling love. If I get to feel love and they don't love me, I win. If I get to feel love and they're faking it, they're making believe, you know, and tell me later, I never really loved you. So yeah, well, it's okay. I loved you. It felt wonderful. Sorry. Sorry you didn't have such a nice experience. I did. How would you like to be like that? That's what it means to love love. You sit there and say you want love, but you give it away because somebody didn't say the right thing or somebody didn't wear the right thing or do the right thing or forgot something. Talking about spirituality. So it's not about struggling to get what you want under any conditions ever. It's about letting go of the part of you that closes you 
because things are not the way it wants. And then if you're closed, you don't have any fun. If you get rid of that part, and you can, but not by struggling, we'll talk about that, your ego does not have to be in there running your life. And it sure as heck is not about getting what the ego wants. And the last talk, I ended in a way I never used the example before, totally, right? Some of you people are parents, and you understand that when a child is young, they throw tantrums, sometimes in a, in a, in a store, <laughs> right? I want that, I want that, terrible twos, whatever it is, right? And we all know the right thing to do, because you love the child, is to, what, which one do you want? Which one? Oh, come here, show me, point it to me, I'll get it for you. That's the right thing to do? Never is it. Never is that the right thing to do. You destroy that child, you destroy everything. It's a terrible thing to do. You do that with your ego every single time it opens its mouth. Well, well, I don't want to go. I, I don't want to go over there. No, no, I don't want to go. You don't go. You tell her, no, no, I don't feel right. I don't want to go. No, I just don't feel right about it. Who doesn't feel right about it? Your ego, this monster inside that's destroying your life by not letting you be open, by letting you appreciate things. That ego, things have to be the way it wants for things to be okay. And that's why you struggle. So eventually you wake up and you realize it is not about giving the little part of you that's having such problems what it wants. It's about using some child psychology. You know, we just sit there and say, look, we, we can't do everything you want. I'll tell you that right now. And the more I do what you want, the more you want it. The more you get ingrained into being spoiled little ego. And so we're going to work with this. And you start working to raise it, not to beat it up. You have to use some psychology. You have to use some, some tact. They can sit there. I used to deal with him that way, the guy in here. I learned not to fight. I used to fight. I learned not to fight. He said, oh, I want that. I really need that. I know I'm afraid of that. I don't want to do that. And I just say to him, you're absolutely right. Tomorrow we'll get it. And he's just stupid. He'd listen to me, right? Every time, right? It's okay. Tomorrow. No, it's just not today. Tomorrow we'll do that, all right? That's what you do to the kid who's throwing a tantrum, too. You just go, let's go out of the store right now, all right? And if we, no, but you don't get it. You use the time to work and you raise it. The Gita says, one should raise the self with self, not trample down the self. That is so deep. It's playing with the words Atman, capitalized, and lowercase Atman, the personal self, and your witness, your higher self, you who's in there. You shouldn't beat down your personal self. It's, it's a thing that exists in the universe, okay? You should raise it up. One should raise the self with self, not trample down the self. So that's the same thing you do with a child. You start doing that with this thing inside of you, and it changes everything. So now notice we're not struggling, we're being more subtle. We're working to raise the energy. If it's scared, don't yell at it or beat it or something like that or to force it to do something. You can talk to it rationally. It's okay. It's good that we learn to do this. Give me your hand. We'll do it together. One should raise the self with self. It's not that you're not freeing yourself of the bondage to this monster. And it is a monster. Ego, everything has to be exactly the way it wants or hell takes place inside and probably outside also. <laughs> you hear me? You're not the only one that lives with your ego. Your significant other has to also. <laughs> so does your boss, so does everybody. And so you start working with it to raise it, to raise it up. This is spirituality. It's higher than everything else. Why? Because it's something you do every moment of your life. It's not an hour's meditation. It's not a retreat, which those are fine things. It's every moment you are in there and so is it, isn't it? Okay, and at any moment it can throw a tantrum. It can get upset. It can... It doesn't even need something to happen. You can think something might happen 10 years from now. Can it, right? Just thinking something might happen 10 years from now can free the ego up. So you just realize, no, this, this thing can't be like, I can't live like this. It's not about getting what I want or avoiding what I don't want. It's about raising this thing inside. The way to do that is with wisdom. It's called jnana yoga. It's the deepest yoga. One of the deepest yogas. What does it mean? Where did it come from? Do you know where the ego came from? Like Freud did a wonderful job of describing it and suppression and all kinds of stuff. Psychology studies that stuff. Where does the ego come from? Most people can't answer that because they're in the ego when they're trying to answer it. I'm going to answer where ego comes from and I'll, I'll get a Nobel Prize. People respect me very deeply in my profession. I'll get a raise. I'll have a publication list. right? So ego is writing about ego. So you can't see the edges. A yogi sees the edges. When you go deep enough inside for a prolonged period of time and you work with yourself, all of us, oh, please listen, 
if you look out at Lake Michigan or something, you can't see the edges. The ocean, you can't see the edges. So you don't know how big it is or what it is. But if the lake is a little smaller, you see the boundaries. That's how ego gets. All of a sudden, there's not ego on the edges, because you worked with it, you're okay, but there's ego in the middle. And you see it as a thing. I remember the first time I saw it as an appliance. It's an appliance that talks. It's an appliance, you have an appliance that blends, appliance that vacuums. This is an appliance that causes trouble. Okay? It's a very special appliance, right? And anything that hits it, right or wrong, <laughs> starts doing that. And you just see it as a thing. It's not you. And you don't have to listen to it either. Now you can't not because you're so addicted to it. It's like a drug. You're addicted. In fact, the reason people do drugs is because they can't extricate themselves from their ego. If they didn't have an ego and they were causing them trouble, why would you do a drug? You do drugs because you're not okay. You're not okay because your ego will never be okay. Why would it be okay? Because you start to see it for what it is. What is your ego? You drop down into this body, the consciousness that's in there. You drop down into this body, and where you came from is so high, I don't want to talk about it. Man was created in the image of God. Your consciousness is a very, very great thing. It dropped down into the body and got lost. That's the fall from the garden. It got lost. But what's this? Who am I? I lost who I am. So I start defining myself by the things that are happening to me. Oh, I know who I am. That's my mommy. My mommy. That's my daddy. That's my crib. That's my toy. You started to define your self-concept as the experiences you're having. And you've been done it every moment for the rest of your life. This is my boyfriend. Get your hands off him. I'm the one who played Dorothy in fifth grade. I'm this. I'm that. I'm attractive. But I don't want to get old. I, 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 I. So basically, you developed this in your psyche, you developed a concept of yourself. That's your self-concept, made out of the things that happened to you. And so now that thing is not real. It can't ever be okay. Why? Because it keeps trying to define itself. You know what the most thing ego want, needs? Acceptance that others agree that you are who you said you are, who you think you are. Just go around people who, oh, you're crazy. You're lying. You're not anything like that. I've seen, whoa. Where do you see the defensiveness come flying out like fire? It needs acceptance because it doesn't know. It's not true. It just made itself up. And by the way, will it change its definition of self if it helps it get what it wants? If you fall in love with somebody, they say, yeah, but I don't like how much makeup you wear and uh, your hair. Oh, that's, that's a non-starter. You really liked how you make up and your hair. I guarantee you, you're changing your makeup, you're changing your hair. So your self-concept is just a fake. It's just something you built to have some solidity in there that I know who I am, but you want me to change it, I'll change it in a minute. I'll change it to be accepted. I'll change it to get what I want. It's a fake thing. And so you start working with it accordingly. You start to see the ego for what it is. You built the ego. Don't you dare blame it. You built it. You got lost and you grabbed all this stuff and said, this is who I am. And you better accept me. And people accept me are my friends. People who don't, <laughs> they're not my friends, are they? It's so beautiful. And so you realize at some point, I need to get rid of this. I need to not define myself as my ego. I need to understand that I am the consciousness aware of the ego. Now what do I do? Little by little, I suggest little by little, not all at once, little by little, you raise it. How? It complains about the stupidest things in the world. It's hot. It's so hot. Maybe I should move. Florida is always hot. But I like my job. I like my husband. He has to say, I don't know what I'm going to do. What are you doing? It's just weather. It's weather. And you want to cause a drama like that? The car in front of me. God, come on, buddy. You got to make the light. You're driving. Why don't you use your blinker? Come on. Is that just me? It's like you cause trouble all the time when there's no trouble. It's causing yourself trouble. In the new book, I call it Low Hanging Fruit. You start working with yourself by raising those moments, the ones that you don't think matter. You get upset because you got wet. You get upset because you dropped something in your pants. You got to go back to work. You get upset because somebody else got the raise that you wanted. You get upset because husband didn't say hello when he came in. Whatever the heck it is. Stupid little things that are just coming and going every moment. You learn to look at the ego and realize, I know how you are. You get upset by everything. You get all kinds of trouble. From now on, we're working with this. How? We're just, if you say it's too hot, I'm going to talk to you about how nice it is. I, I've told you that before, how I worked with him. Because it's hot in Florida. I didn't have air conditioning or anything when I built this place out here. And so he complained, it's hot. And I'd ask him, why is it hot? 
I said, it's the sun. The sun is out there. I said, it's the sun? I don't see a sun. What do you mean? I said, I, don't, I see a star. I talked to him. I see a star. What do you mean? He says, it's a star, isn't it? You like stars? I like stars. Who doesn't like stars? All right? So you're telling me you're so close to a star, so close to a star that you feel its heat. That's pretty neat, isn't it? 93 million miles away, and you're complaining about the heat. How big would a fire have to be in Miami, which is about 350 miles away, for you to feel it here? If the entire city caught fire, you would not feel it here. That thing's 93 million miles away. You learn to raise yourself. There's so many neat things you can do with yourself, and all of a sudden you sit there and say, this is neat, I feel a star. And, and you can change things, like you did not get sunburned, you got star burned. And that's pretty, think about it for a second, you got star burned. You're so close to a star that your, your face is red. Wow! All of a sudden you, you changed, you worked with yourself. Use positive thinking, mantra, witness consciousness, whatever you want. But don't leave that stupid thing down there ruining your life. People are not ruining your life, you're ruining your life. The moment in front of you is not bothering you. You're bothering yourself about the moment in front of you. Well, how about we stop doing that? That's spirituality. No, that's not a struggle, is it? That's inclusive. You're bringing your mind up with you. You're helping all of it. Say your heart gets hurt. You shouldn't bother. What does it, what does it mean? Anybody, does anybody know what it means your heart got hurt? Does anybody ever feel razor blades in there? What is that? Nobody knows. They just don't like it. What is that? That is, you know, the new book goes in, in great detail. That is the flow of Shakti, God, Spirit, inside of you that was flowing in a certain direction because it connected with somebody else. So it was used to flowing this way. And you felt strength. You felt well-being, right? Then all of a sudden, the situation changed. Where's that energy going to go? It's like a river is flowing and giving away. I can't do it anymore. Well, okay, the mess is going to go on and it has to rechange its direction. The whole heart gets weird. That's what's happening. These are flows of energy and one just got disturbed. It can't flow right. So it feels like knots and fighting. You should look at it marveled. That's when you're getting somewhere. When you can look at that and say, wow, look at that. That's unbelievable. And then you learn to not fight it. You learn to work with it. You learn to raise it up. You learn to give it another channel where it can flow. You're going to use to teach that. If you have desires or fears that are very strong, don't go with them and don't get upset suppressing them. Channel them. Run. Start a hobby. Do something with the energy that's blocked and can't flow in a way that's constructive. And you're going to find out life is much more beautiful. You're in there and have the right to work with yourself. That is spirituality. Not struggle with yourself. It's not a matter of, I don't want to feel this way. I want to do I got to get this person back or I'll find an alternative. You know, just on the rebound. No, 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 no. We can do it, but it's not going to work, right? It's how can I work with this energy flow so I can bring it up? I want to bring it up. Always you want to bring up. There's a flow of energy inside of you. Now it's going out to try to get what it wants. Eventually it will turn inside because you're working with it, but it doesn't struggle in there. You just constantly work on, yes, I'm blocked. Yes, I know I have these needs. Yes, I know that my energy was flowing a certain way because the needs were open and there was an openness, but now the person died. The person left me. The person said what I didn't want to hear. They held hands with somebody else. I didn't take much of it. And so basically now it's disturbed inside. That's because you're blocked. So how do I use this constructively to release the blockages and raise the energy up? And in the end, that is spirituality. Spirituality is about raising yourself you're raising yourself, not struggling or fighting. You're raising yourself. But it's not easy, is it? Because those are, are difficult things to experience and you can't handle them. So you do anything, anything you can to not have this feeling anymore. Spirituality is about learning to handle what's going on inside of you. I want you to reach the point where you look at your heart and sit there and say, come on, you can do better than that. Hit me with your best shot. And you mean it. I want to be at peace with my heart. I want to be at peace with my mind. That's not going to have my fighting with them, is it? You work with it. You raise it. And so when your heart is having some trouble, you raise it up. You raise it up. Breathing works really good. All the techniques work, but not if you're misusing them. Not if you use them to suppress or use them to get what you want. You need to use them to raise yourself. 
So yes, of course, if your energy is blocked, do some yoga. But don't do yoga to impress everybody. Don't do yoga because you do it better than somebody else. That's ridiculous. You do yoga because it helps free energy flows. And what do you do with the energy flow? Bring it up. Always bring it up. Bring it up. I don't know how to talk to you about that. There's a flow of energy inside of you that will start to flow up. And when it does, it brings love, peace, joy, harmony, inspiration, intuition. All of that comes with the energy flow. Everything you ever want in your whole life. It can't flow because you're busy fighting with everything and blocking. You are using that energy to get what you want. The same energy that's divine and spiritual, you're using to go outside and manipulate people and argue and fight and do all kinds of stuff. It's the same energy. So you learn, it's called transmutation of the energy. As it gets in there and gets weird, breathe, breathe, work with it. Ramana used to say, and it works, by the way, put a nostril on your heart and breathe in and out through the nostril. You'll find out energy releases. Even when your heart's hurting, it can feel better because you're working with it. It's not magic. It's like you've decided to work with it instead of fight with it or to suppress it. Always raise everything up. Same thing with a disturbed mind. Don't worry about a disturbed mind. It's disturbed because you stored all kinds of disturbing stuff inside of you. That's where I got understanding the mind. Why does the voice talk so much? It's trying to release the garbage you stored inside. Okay, you had a divorce five years ago, but you didn't really get divorced, not inside. <laughs> You're still going through the same arguments, the same pain, the same stuff. And so it's trying to push its way out and expresses itself through the mind. So don't get mad at the mind. Look at it compassionately and say, I'm sorry that I couldn't handle the situation better. And so now you're trying to throw it out to purify, just like the immune system of your body goes and fights and clears stuff up. So your heart and your mind are trying to clear this. Believe me, I've been doing it for 50 years. I made a statement to you. Your heart and your mind are trying to purify the garbage you stored inside. And since you stored it as pain, it feels like pain and fear and anxiety. And then the mind talks about this stuff. And instead of working with it by releasing the stuff you stored, you go out and try to get what you want to compensate for the problems you have. So spirituality is about transmutation. It's about working with the energy, not fighting. You don't ever fight with yourself. You don't struggle and fight with the world, people, places, things, and you don't struggle with yourself. You keep relaxing. You just keep relaxing and releasing. Energy comes up, you relax and release. I dare you. Energy comes up, you relax and release. That's all you have to do. If you will stop fighting it and stop resisting it and stop thinking it's supposed to be a certain way, but instead release it when it comes up. It's trying to free. It's trying to not be in there. And you're saying, you don't you talk to me that way. <laughs> you know what I mean? It should be your welcome. That's what you get when you're a very mature spiritual being. You are welcome inside of me. Who is? Everything. Every single thing. Ego, this, that, id, superego. Come on, have a party. I'm going to sit back here, love you to pieces. I understand this is society laid a trip on my head. Religion did, everything did. And so that's why the mind talks that way. So they're cute. It's like the echo of my past. Come on up, come on up. But let it go, let it go. Somebody once asked the great saint, Ramakrishna, does an enlightened being ever feel anger? I was so shocked to hear his answer. He said, yes but it's like riding on water. In other words, as it happens, it's gone. You can't see what wrote on water. You have to see it for a billion of a second. This stuff's welcome inside of you. Fear, anxiety, jealousy. No, don't fight. Learn to sit back and say, I can handle that. I can handle that there's a human feeling of fear, a human feeling of anxiety, a human feeling of jealousy, a human feeling of need. They're real. They're in there. If you can handle them, you can let them go. They come up, you relax. Welcome, you're welcome. Here, here, come on. Up to God, back to God. Come on in, pass through, no marks. Wow, that's a very high state. Now you don't have to worry about anything. <laughs> there's nothing that, in a spiritual being, there's nothing that doesn't fit inside of you. It all fits. It's all welcome to come and pass through. And you're left free. You can assure you and his guru. Like I talk an hour. These guys do one-liners. He said, an ignored guest quickly leaves. That's how he said how to work with the mind and the heart. An ignored guest quickly leaves. What does that mean? If I can handle that this stuff's going on inside of me, it goes right through. I'm not fighting with it. It doesn't fight with me. The wind. The wind blows. What do I do when the wind blows? Let it go. No, yes. <laughs> Let it blow past you. But it messes my hair. I don't like what it feels like when it goes across my face. Well, then you're in trouble. You have to fight your whole life against the wind. Otherwise, you just relax, 
let it pass, enjoy, enjoy the feeling of it passing. Imagine if you could be that way with everything. All your emotions, all the mental thoughts, they just come and they go. They come and they go. And they leave you as they found you, at peace, serene, content. That's what's left of you is spiritual. It then goes up by itself. When you stop struggling with yourself, all the energy goes up. So the purpose of this talk was to talk about the fact that at least once in your life someone told you it's not about struggling. It's about acceptance. It's about surrender. It's about real peace, not peace you create. The peace that passes all understanding. The peace that's there when all the rest is still there, passing through, and you're still deeply at peace. All right, I want you to work with these things. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Jai Gurdjieff.